Well, we're going to continue our teach the teaching on the Omer and how it applies to you and how Yeshua exemplifies it for you. Um, we're going to start first with a quick review of the agencies that we've had. The very first thing was down on the bottom, your left, the sickle or a scythe. The Lord uses one of these to separate you from your corner in the world, and he draws you to himself just as you are. The second one is the cane or the sledge. It's just above the man's head. The Lord uses one of these to separate your baggage from you, where he's taking you. Can you stop that? Where he's taking you, you won't need any of that baggage. The third thing was the wind, or the fork, or a basket. Not the one in the middle, but the one up in the top corner. The Lord's breath separates and scatters your baggage so you can move forward with your life. Now in Leviticus, only the finest of anything was offered to the Lord. So the fourth agency is fire, over on the right. For this, the Lord puts you into a community. That's shown the fire pan. The fire pan is where you studied the Torah. He please fix this thing. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, even more. There, there we go. Whew, much better. All right, so for this, the Lord puts you into a community, which is like a fire pan. And there's where you study the Torah, which is his fire. That's where he parches and changes the way other people see you. This way, your outer self changes to the Lord's design, and you are once again separated from the world in order to be set apart to him. Now, the Lord's purpose is to separate and change you into his image by all of these agencies. The harvester's sickle separates you from the world. The thresher's cane separates baggage. The winnower's wind separates and scatters the baggage. And the parcher's fire changes your outer looks. Now, before the next step, you must cool down from that fiery trial. Are you ready? Are you mellow, relaxed, and calm? <gasps> what, Lord? You mean, no, you can't be serious. Is this what you've planned all along? All along? I'm a good person now. I'm a good seed. I don't do any of those bad pagan things anymore. I ha I've changed the way I am, Lord. What about all the steps that you've put me through already? <sighs> Look at me, Lord. And in submission, you answer, yes, Lord. You know what I need to be your bride. So, uh... What's next, Lord? Bring it on. So the fifth agency is where those good seeds are made into coarse, medium, or fine flour on a millstone. And good people are changed once more. The Lord puts you, his good seed, into a millstone where you will be crushed and separated again. You are between a rock and a hard place with no escape route, no crevices or wind to keep you from the crushing stone. Here are two family millstones. Well, there's one there. Both of which are small in comparison to the communal millstone. So why is it necessary to mill? Rightly so, it's not necessary if, after winnowing, the good seeds are set aside for next year's planting or for eating to take on a journey. So of course, they could be milled without first being over a fire and made into daily bread. But none of these seeds were destined to the Lord's altar. So let's look closer at milling, which produces flour in different states of refinement. Each type of flour is milled for a specific purpose and for a different length of time until it is coarse, medium, or fine. The same is true for you. So pay attention. It isn't, true, isn't it true that people come to the Lord in different stages of sanctification? What about the apostles who lived with Yeshua? And what about the thief on the cross who dried, died with him in Luke 23, 40 through 43? 
what about that person who repented just before his last breath? Or Johnny Erickson Tata, a quadriplegic gospel speaker artist? Or Pastor Richard Wormbrand, who prayed for and with those who tortured him in a Hungarian prison? Or Billy Graham, great evangelist? Clearly, they're all not equal in their depths of sanctification, only justification. But again, why? I found the figurative definition of to mill to be quite interesting in that Webster's Dictionary. To mill is an experience that tortures, but refines or disillusions one. Now, I personally can recall experiences in my past which did just that. The experiences refined who I saw the Lord to be and who I saw myself to be. Can you recall experiences in your life? Did they disillusion you with your perception of the Lord and yourself? Now read this with me. The colloquial explanation for through the mill. It takes one through the sufficient disciplines or training necessary to bring one to a certain degree of knowledge or skill or mental state. The ending, mental state, is the key. It sheds more light on the preparation of the good seed into his bride. But there's more to the definition. Here it is. It's to finish or transform using a millstone, which is figuratively a heavy burden. Look at the size of that stone. Would you like to be underneath that? Now, this is why you are going under the millstone. It's about your mental state and just how pure you are. Which describes your state today? 10%? 25%? How about 33 and a third percent? Anybody here 50% pure? There's still room for all of us. To be the Lord's bride, there must be a low percent of self and a high percent of the Lord in you. Only the finest which resembles him will be chosen as the Lord's bride. Now to reach this quality, the millstone must go over and over and over to make you finer and finer. Yet the Creator's eyes will never, ever leave you while the crushing grinding continues. The world may not look like a good place to be right now, so focus once more on the Lord and not on the surroundings until the millstone is silent. And look up at him. Finally, the valley low testimony stops, and you have shalom and peace and quiet and calm reigning once more, and the world suddenly becomes a place of vibrant colors and sweet fragrances. Now the conclusion, what is next? Am I done now, Lord? Is there more? Am I the finest flower? Am I your bride? Is the wedding celebration next? No, my love, no, my love. There's one more. But remember how much I love you, the Lord replies. And that is today's lesson. Now, if you will stand and we will say the blessing. Remember to keep reading your book. There's a lot more in the book. Ready? For those who aren't sure, this is the fifth week. For those who haven't been counting, okay. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu V'nitzvatav Vitzivanu Al Sifarat HaOmer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, whose commandments add holiness to our lives and who gives us the command of counting the Omer. 
Today is 35 days, which is five weeks and zero days of the counting of the Omer. Now, before we go anywhere, what special event is going to come this week? Yes, good. The 40th day is coming. It's the anniversary of the Lord's ascension. It's been forgotten. If you've been counting and reflecting on Yeshua for 40 days and walking with him as the disciples did, starting Wednesday night, imagine what it must have been like to watch him ascend, to lose his physical presence, to wonder, would you ever smell his scent? Would you ever touch him again or hear his voice? Imagine that Yeshua left you right now. Now we'll dance with Paul.